All right, my clock says six o'clock. So let's see if I can do this without messing up too much. All right, so six o'clock and we're gonna get started. I wanna talk just a second about myself. I know a lot of folks know uh, much about me. So I'm a 43 year uh, food service veteran. I started in uh, 1977. So actually probably 44 years if you do the math. Um, I was a corporate trainer for several different uh, fast service or quick service restaurant chains. Uh, done, have done all the big ones, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Hardee's, Shoney's, even though that's not uh, quick service, it's sit down. Uh, Whataburger, uh, did a Quiznos, owned a Quiznos for a while. Started my own place that sold Philly cheesesteaks. Uh, and in all of that time of doing all that stuff, I also moonlighted doing my own uh, hot dog cart for a number of years. So my daytime job was training people how to run restaurants. My nighttime job was selling hot dogs. Uh, and at one point I had two hot dog carts and a food trailer all going simultaneously. So, uh, you know, food has just always been my life. And as a side note, I'm also an author of the three different books you see on your screen there. Uh, the most recent one, that uh, prominent one, the Food Truck 101, I wrote uh, early last year and released it. And it's doing quite well. And I'm most proud of it because it is a very big book it's 300 some pages if you buy the the one that's online um so it's got everything in it that i could possibly think of and then of course as soon as i set it in for publication a lot of more stuff so that's where some of the uh things that i published and released to you guys in the file section is just things i came up with after the book already hit the uh, publisher all right so marketing <clears throat> Marketing for a food truck is simply just an invitation to please come buy my food. That's all any marketing is. Um, and the one thing that uh, a lot of folks really don't consider is marketing is everywhere within your business. Every single thing you do is marketing. It's leaving an impression on the people, either a good one or a bad one. So think about it as an invitation. And we all know what we do at home when uh, we invite folks over. It's panic time. And then we're like uh, poor old SpongeBob there trying to clean and wipe and do everything we possibly can because you realize, oh crap, somebody that we invited is going to go into the bathroom or go into one of the other rooms and everything has to be spotless and perfect. Same thing with your food truck business. You want to have that exact same attitude. Because before you invite folks over, you want to make sure that the business is ready. You want to impress. And just like Johnny Bravo there, you've got to be self-centered when it comes to impressing your guests. Take everything into consideration. So you want to make certain that your house is in order. And that's we're talking about cleanliness. We want to make sure that you're properly staffed so you can give great service. Whether you're a single operator or you have a team of three or five or seven that you've got to be staffed for what you normally would operate. You want to make sure your staff is trained, that they know what you're doing as far as handling day-to-day -day guests. And if you do any kind of a marketing promotion, whether you're doing coupons or discounts, they need to know about them. Because it's very frustrating as a customer walks up and they've got uh, in their hand a discount card that you've given them. And they hand it to the cashier and the cashier knows nothing about it. And they have to turn and say, hey, boss, what is this? So now you slow down your service because you didn't train your staff. Of course, you want to make sure you're properly stocked. If you're running a special on a particular product or featuring a particular product, that focuses people's attention and they're going to buy it. You want to make sure that you have enough to get through whatever amount of time you're going to be open. So you remember, you can't sell what you don't have. And then understand your attitude drives your results. You've got to be excited. Every day, having done this for 40 some years, I would get a little nervous when I look at the clock and go, it's 11 o'clock. A little bit of nerves in the stomach because you know it's going to start getting busier. And then you start thinking about things that you should be doing to get ready to handle the business as it comes in. If you're not a little tiny bit nervous, you're getting complacent and you're missing details and you're just phoning it in. So 
take that little bit of bundle of nerves that you got and be excited that it's there. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Let's talk about some specifics on uh, real marketing strategies and starting with the easy stuff. And that's passive marketing. Passive marketing. As you can see, it's things that we all probably have at our fingertips or have used or use on a daily basis. Things like your signs, your logos, your menus, the wrap on your truck or trailer, uh, feather flags, the bouncy flags, uh, banner, social media, all of those things are one and done activities. Basically, we set those things up, we purchase them, we set them out, and then we hope that people notice. So basically, everything that you're looking at here is line of sight. So the, the folks have to be walking around uh, in the area that you are to be able to see your truck, to see the wrap, to see the, the flags or the signs you have out. Social media is the same way. If they're not logged into Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whichever one you use, they're not seeing what you're doing. So it's passive marketing. Then we have active marketing. And this is the one that makes some shy people really, really kind of scared because you're going to be knocking on doors. Not in a literal sense, but you're going to be going into businesses and asking them to post a flyer for their employees to come down and uh, eat with you during lunch. You're going to talk to them about the businesses that the business that you have and the food that you sell. So you're going to be talking face to face with people. And there are tons of activities that you can do that are active. And we'll go over some of those a little bit later, but in the booklet, there's 55 different things that you can go out and do that are um, physically different than a passive activity. And like I said, the download is in the description. Probably haven't done that yet, but it will be in the description of the video. There was a separate post I put up a little bit ago that has the 43-page uh, the guideline for it. Like I said, it's got 55 marketing strategies. It's got 50 social media prompts. Then it's got a, a sample marketing plan. So let's look at the marketing plan. This is what you're going to go by um, pretty much every second that you're in your, your business. As you can see, the, the, um, the plan is marked into daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and then ongoing activities. This is just a sample. This is by no means set in stone. This is the only possible thing you can do. But if you'll notice, you're going to be wearing the marketing hat pretty much daily. You cannot get away from marketing. So let's look specifically at the daily things. And um, these are just, again, examples. Uh, you want to post your uh, location and serving times on social media. Do that before you do any kind of food prep. You want to do that early in the morning or early in the day compared to when you're actually going to be out vending. The reason you want to do it is so that you've got that first little notification that people are going to get that says, hey, this particular food truck that I chose to follow is now going to be someplace today. And they're able to, to look at what you're posting and say, oh, they're going to be near where I'm working today. So they can have that mental um, preparation in their mind of, Ooh, I, I love that product they sell. I can't wait to go get it today at lunch. So you've already planted a seed for those folks to get out. That's what social media does. And that's where you start to get a little bit active because you're doing it more than just having a, a website or a Facebook page and hope people go to it. You're posting. And people that like your posts are going to get notifications that, hey, this particular business has posted something you might be interested in. You want to follow up on any comments that were posted since the last time you logged in. So even if somebody just puts a random comment and says, um, I love your hot dogs or I love your hamburgers, you want to respond to that. And it needs to be uh, a sincere response. You don't want to just uh, do a copy and paste of thank you or, you know, thank you for the kind words. You want to say, I'm so glad you, you love the hot dog. And so, you know, whatever the product is, you want to let them know you actually read the post and that you're commenting back to their posts specifically. So no form letters. Everything should be sincere. And before you leave the social media, make sure that you have, have put a post up that has like a daily feature or a discount. 
because what those things do is they focus people into your business on a, either a specific product or a reason to go visit your business. Um, you don't have to do discounts. Again, these are just examples, but you should feature a product. A feature doesn't mean it's on sale. A feature means that you have taken the time to do extra prep on a particular item and you want those folks to buy it. So it's featured and it can be a full, full price feature. One example I like to use is when I worked at Shoney's, I had a kitchen manager who sometimes was not the brightest bulb uh, in the lamp. And sometimes he would pull out too much product to thaw. Once the product's pulled out to thaw, then it's on a timer. It has to be used within a certain number of days, otherwise it's, you're throwing it away. Well, when he would pull out too much product, we would start looking at, okay, we have to sell all of this within two days or three days, whatever the hold time was for it. We would feature the product. Liver and onions is one that he always over aggressively pulled out too much liver. Not a popular product, but when you put it on a little chalkboard as people are eating in the restaurant, they stop and read the chalkboard. And the folks that like liver, they go ahead and order it because we've now focused them in on a particular product. Didn't put it on sale. And we would always sell out of the liver and onions that he had pulled that was, was chasing an expiration date. So that's why you want to do a feature. A feature also means you're putting a picture of your food up and make sure it's your picture. Don't use a generic um, or stock photo. Make it yours. Even if it's on a plate from your house, you know, a very cute decorative plate, and that's not the way you would serve it, what matters is how the sandwich looks or the plate of food looks. And then you want to make sure that you can duplicate what you're putting on those pictures. Every menu item that I've ever done, ever, <laughs> has been something I made and I made it on the fly. I didn't take 15 minutes to arrange each piece of meat so that it stood up perfect and make sure each little shred of lettuce was exactly perfect. I made the sandwich, set it on the counter, or sometimes I would hold it in my hand, and take a picture of it. And then that would become what was on my menu so that I knew I could make that sandwich look that way every single time. You want to check all the review sites that you're potentially on. Go through Yelp and uh, Google reviews and all the different places there could potentially be a review on you and make sure that you're reading those reviews and reacting to them. And if you're able to leave comments, you want to leave comments. People like um, when they leave comments, that the businesses respond to those comments and they get that little endorphin rush of, hey, they acknowledge me. So do that for anybody that takes time to comment or leaves a review. POP is something you very rarely hear uh, in food vending, but POP stands for point of purchase. And it's usually in reference to advertising material. So those feather flags that you put up or the A-frame menu that you stand out, um, even looking at your wrap, make sure that it is in good condition and it's posted the way you expect it to be posted. Uh, flags tend to get tattered uh, very easily. If you work in a place like Florida, the sun will just bleach them and then you're putting up a, a white flag basically and you look like you're surrendering from a distance. So make sure your stuff looks good. Uh, if slow points occur during service, your line breaks and there's nobody there, most food truckers say, oh, time to pack up. And that's the wrong attitude. If you set up on your social media post that I'm going to be someplace from 11 to 2, then you better be there from 11 to 2. Because I can guarantee you that when you close it at 1.30, somebody's coming at 1.35 and you're already gone and they're probably going to leave a neg negative review and you deserve it. If you say you're going to be somewhere, for a set number of hours and you better be there for that set number of hours. And yeah, I sound like a boss at that point because that's how I look at the businesses around me. If you tell me you're gonna do something and I'm supposed to take you at your word, then keep your word. Now, if you're unsure of your inventory levels and you're afraid you're going to run out, then just put, I'll be there from 11 until whenever. So at least that way somebody can't come at 135 and say, oh crap, they're not here. I'm leaving a bad review because you didn't tell them you're going to be there to 135. 
you told him you'd be there until whenever. Not the most uh, secure way to get people coming in because they'll they'll rush to you at 11 because they know you're going to be there. But by 12, they might be thinking, oh, they're out. By one, they're really assuming you're out. And definitely by two, they know you're out. So think about what you post on those uh, on your social media and then stick to it. I always had a cutoff point when I was doing um, any kind of food that I knew how long it would take somebody to go get more food so that I didn't actually run out. When I reached that cutoff point, I would send somebody off to get the food so that they got back before I could run out. So have those points in mind, whether it's um, know how many of a certain product you can sell uh, in a half hour or 40 minutes or however long it takes somebody to go to the store and grab some more. But anyway, when you do have those slow points in service, in uh, in your your uh, service time, rather, you want to post on social media. Hey, guys, you know, I'm still here at, um, you know, in front of Lowe's. Come on down. We'll be here until 2. Get out of the truck or your trailer, out from behind the cart. Start waving to people. If you got a sign, spin it. I never thought that sign, sign spinners was a um, useful tool to use until one of my partners said, put somebody out on the road with a sign. I'm like, dude, they're not going to get out there and, and care. Well, we sent a guy out. He walked up and down the street, spinning a sign with uh, our logo on it. And it had a big arrow pointing to where the, the uh, restaurant was. And lo and behold, people would come in and say, I didn't know y'all was here. If that guy hadn't been out there spinning that sign, I'd have never stopped in. Those kind of comments prove that people do read the sign spinners because it's something different. So get out and spin your own sign. As you're closing for the day or after you close for the day, log into your social media one more time, look for any comments, reviews, and then respond to those. Because those are in real time or close to real time. And let those folks know that, hey, I'm here to, to listen to what you got to say. So again, examples of what you can do weekly. Visit or revisit large offices, uh, large buildings, or businesses, rather, uh, and employers. Uh, you know, know who is the bigger employers in your area, whether it's a hospital or uh, an Air Force base, a manufacturing plant, whatever it is, know who the big employers are. And then as much as possible, stop by and see the bosses of those places. Drop off flyers, ask them to put them in break rooms, give the management discount cards or coupons, invite the people to come to your business and know what businesses are in your area. Uh, it's very discouraging when I talk to folks and they tell me that they have the perfect site and they're going to set up. And I ask them, okay, tell me about the businesses that are w within two blocks of you and they don't know. Well, those people are going to be the ones that are going to come to your your food cart or your, your trailer or your truck and you don't even know who they are. Get out there and see who's around you. Uh, so you want to e ethically bribe people. And what that means is give them a coupon or discount to post up that uh, uh, flyer that you've got in their break room. They may or may not do it. They may just throw your stuff in the trash as soon as you walk out the door, but at least you're doing something to, to promote your business. Um, radio DJs love food. And it's a good relationship to have with the radio because you can do in-trade um, advertising with them. What that means is you're going to offer them a certain amount of food at your retail price so you know that you, you've got some uh, latitude there as far as how much it really costs you uh, for them to, you know, contest of the day or word of the day or whatever it is. And this is sponsored by, um, you know, Bill's Hot Dog Cart. And that gets your name out there at a minimal cost. I've had a world of uh, good luck with radio because there are still people that do listen to radio. Uh, but if you surprise a DJ with just, you know, a handful of sandwiches, um, you know, surprise the um, marketing director there at the radio station, the DJ is going to say, oh, Bill just stopped by with these great hot dogs and they're awesome. And that's all you need. That is absolutely all you need. And if the DJ really likes your food, he's going to ask if uh, he can say where you're located for the day. So don't discount something because you haven't tried or it doesn't sound smart. Give it a try. 
uh, talk to school officials about student appreciation days or fundraising or uh, concession stand operation or any of the clubs that the schools have to help them raise money to pay for band uniforms or you know the trip for the uh, uh, robotics team or, or whatever they do you want to help them fundraise now here's the thing about fundraising that uh, i see ask often fundraising doesn't mean that you uh, donate all of your proceeds or your profits for a particular day or an hour or whatever what you want to do is engage the school to get them to bring sales to you that you don't already normally get on your own and then you give them a portion of those sales for example if you got a little bit of, of sales history and you want to um, help a school out you pick a day not a Friday or Saturday or day you're normally going to be busy you're going to pick a day when you're not as busy say a Tuesday and a Tuesday evening for you you're open say five to eight and that average day for you is a thousand dollars so what you do is you go to the school and say yeah I can help you do this fundraiser on Tuesday we can do it from five to eight and every uh, sale that you guys have come from your um, uh, you know the students and the parents and the faculty those folks I will give you a portion of those sales and then you give them a flyer that has a number of uh, coupons on it for the uh, person when they come to your business here is what I am um, you know I am from the school here's my proof that I'm from the school and make sure that my order and the total of my order gets put into that donation hat so that your normal thousand dollars that you normally do is still there they don't know anything about the um, the uh, school fundraiser so you're getting full um, benefit of their sales and the school has to bring you additional sales in that a little coupon or a little certificate that you give those folks to give to their uh, potential guests for you to prove that hey they're representing the local elementary school and then you just staple the uh, receipt or write down the total on it and add all those little pieces of paper up at the end of the day and you print them, present them with a check for whatever amount you guys agreed upon that way you're not giving away sales that you were getting without benefit of them helping you and I hope that's clear if it's not I can actually write it out and make it uh, more clear because we did that many many times we put all the work onto them to drive the sales into the the uh, restaurant or the the food truck we didn't just give them money just because it was Tuesday night and and we did a thousand dollars because we were going to do that anyway without them if you're going to help operate a concession stand uh, to benefit the um, the school or the high school what you could do is actually offer to train their people if they have uh, your know, hospitality clubs and that type of thing that are going to try to get into some type of food service in their future they might have those um, students populate the concession stand you could help uh, train those people using your food uh, to where you don't have to use your own labor and then give them a, again a portion of the uh, proceeds of the sales while you're also helping to, to teach um, new people some of the uh, ins and outs of food service but there's opportunities there but you go look for them uh, again, the point is to do something outside of your cell phone. If your first reaction when it slows down is to uh, get on social media and not your business social media, but your personal social media, then you've got a problem. And that problem is you're not going to have sales. Monthly things you want to think about are being a part of the Chamber of Commerce, um, networking groups, charity groups, anything that, that you're going to be supporting you want to attend their meetings and do things that are going to help move your business forward um, you just never know who you're going to meet at those kind of meetings uh, that wants a big catering and they want to do it with a small business uh, so you're always looking for the next big um, the next big guest you're going to have or the next big client and you can't do that if you're sitting at home watching TV and you can't do that if you're you're on your cell phone you got to get out and get active uh, in your community uh, determine your next month's specials coupons anything you're going to do think ahead on that 
um, schedule in large sales events like fairs or festivals and in catering. Always be thinking ahead. My dad always used to say, if you plan for tomorrow, you don't have to worry about today. So you always think ahead so that when those activities come up, you already have the plan. You know what you're doing. If you want to email uh, previous catering clients, offer them a deal, uh, remind them, hey, I'm still here. You just want to keep yourself uh, top of mind for those folks. Um, you want to email businesses and offices that you have a, an existing relationship with. Chances are, if you don't have an existing relationship, your email is going to end up in spam. But you want to, again, people that you have in a, a relationship with, remind them about customer appreciation, employee appreciation, anything you can do to help uh, drive business. Um, one, one little thing you can do is with uh, call centers. Uh, call centers like having food trucks come in. It's a little reward for their employees. Uh, other businesses where the employees don't actually leave an office, you know, being able to supply them with even a, a monthly um, you know, opportunity for different food is a good thing. Had to have a drink there. My Zephyr Hill spring water was beckoning me and my voice was getting kind of scratchy. All right, contact school, civic organizations, uh, anything that you can think of to help do a potential fundraiser. But you want to have those plans laid out. Now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, I wish I'd have really written out some of the uh, the fundraising opportunities that we've done in the past. Some of them worked really well. Some of them were okay. But all of them got our name out into the uh, the city. And that's what you want. You want people talking about you in a positive way. <clears throat> quarterly you want to plan for one community event or a fundraising event um i know they do a lot of cancer runs 5k runs for uh, fundraisers whatever your community does um, you want to get involved with at least one a quarter doesn't mean that you have to have your food there and you're giving away a ton of food it could just be you uh, as the business owner being there and um you know passing out waters for people on a 5k run you know, passing out coupons to people that are uh, visiting uh, or spectating or whatever's going on. You don't physically have to be out selling food, but you have to be out there to encourage people to come visit your business. And if they need somebody to sell food, then by all means, get out there and do that too. Giving back is priceless. So don't look at it as, okay, I'm going to spend 20 hours over the course of this quarter developing this event, and it's only going to bring me $200. What you're looking at is the goodwill that gets built up by you being involved in your community. You want to be the go-to business that people know that, hey, if they're able to help us, they're going to help us. And again, that doesn't mean giving away money. Time is something that uh, a lot of organizations just need. They need leadership. I got asked to do um, in a... a um, Foster Parents Association in Marion County, Florida, way back when I was a young man. Had no kids, but they wanted somebody to give them some leadership to help them get United Way funding. And the reason they came to me was because they knew my activities with the restaurant that I uh, worked at down there. And they knew that if I said I could do something, I was going to give it 110%. So that kind of uh, involvement got me into an organization that I stayed with for three years and did all kinds of neat stuff that helped my business along because every opportunity they were having me come out and, and uh, uh, help them fundraise, sell, uh, you know, lots of food or just in general, just help them um, when they would do parties and get togethers for their children, just be the one that's helping supply food and they would pay me to do that. So don't ever turn something down because you never know where it's going to lead to. And then ongoing guest recovery. You want to have a procedural procedure to handle guests and their complaints because uh, they're going to happen. We're not perfect. If people aren't complaining from time to time, that means they don't care enough about your business to want to come back. A complaint is... If you really think about it, they're saying, I like what you do, but you screwed up today. Please fix it so I want to come back tomorrow. That's what they're saying. 
I guess they're going to be mean. They're going to be hateful. And they're going to um, you know, maybe even call you rude names. I've had um, folks tell me the one I've made a sandwich, and I put onions on it out of habit because, you know, nine, uh, nine ingredients, and you're used to putting all nine of them on there, and somebody says, I don't want onions, and you do it out of habit. It doesn't mean you're mean. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means you have fallen into that habit. And they bring it back, and they're a little bit rude, and I tell them, and I tell them you know what? You're right. I'm an idiot. I put onions on something, and you told me not to. I'm going to make you a new one. And depending upon their demeanor, I might even refund their money. And I know all you people are gasping right now, going, oh my God, you're giving away money. You're giving back a refund. I would never do that. I've been in business 43 years. And I have people that still seek me out today, wanting to know well, the next time I'm going to open. And it's been three years since I served any food. I retired in 2017. But people still want to know when I'm coming out to set up again. Whenever I go to my hometown in Kentucky, and I haven't served food in Kentucky since the mid-80s, when I recognize customers that I used to, to deal with, you know, hey, we miss your place. You know, those kind of people, because they not only like the food, they like the service and they like the attitude of the people I had working for me. So don't be afraid to give back some money when you make a mistake because your goal is to get them to come back tomorrow and give you more money. When you chase somebody away, when you fire a customer, that's what I call it, when you fire a guest, don't want you to come back because you're a jerk. You will never, ever get money from them. And chances are they're going to tell a whole bunch of other people what a rude person you are. Now, today, if you did $1,000, your goal for tomorrow is to do a thousand and one. And you can't do that if you're upsetting people. So I'm going to make that really, really clear. Guest recovery is your financial future. You got to know your competition. You got to prove you're better than they are. Me and my wife analyze everything when we go into restaurants. We analyze everything when we go to a new food truck. We are looking at every possible detail because we know the business. I've got 43 years, 44 years doing uh, food service. My wife has 30 something. She's been doing it a long, long time. We met in a restaurant, but our backgrounds diverge enough that she's worked for places I haven't worked. She's done certain foods I've never done and don't want to do because she likes them, but she does them and she does them well. We make a really good team. That's why we set up the group, and that's why um, you know we do the things that we do because we want to help a whole bunch of other people get better than we are. I want to know that uh, forty some years from now, somebody's listening to this, is doing their own video or whatever technology they got, saying, "I remember when somebody helped me to get better. Now I'm going to help you to get better." So know your competition. You got to beat them. You got to know what they do. Uh, and then one of the comments up there is be on the lookout, a bolo, be on the lookout for a better location. You never know when there's going to be road construction on a, on a road that's going to just decimate your business. You never know when there's um, going to be a, a, a business closed down nearby that pulls away, you know, 5,000 potential guests a day. You never know when it's going to happen and you don't want to be scrambling when it does happen. One of the uh, big fallouts from last year, um, some people got locked into doing, um, you know, business on, say, on base, on an Air Force base, or some other place that had um, some government control. So when COVID starts and, and they start putting um, some lockdowns in place to where employees can't do certain things in a business that's not a part of like the Air Force Base can't come in anymore. Those businesses were, were basically screwed. It's like, oh crap, what do we do? We've been resting on our laurels, laurels all these years, uh, going to this one place, and now that place is no longer available to us. What do we do? And it was, it was a rough several months for a number of people I know because they had nowhere to go. They had nowhere to turn because they weren't always looking for something better. 
if I set up in front of a Dollar Tree and do a thousand dollars tonight, and I go just a mile down the road and set up at a convenience store and do fifteen hundred, where do you think I'm going to go consistently with fifteen hundred? But if I am not looking for that new location, I would think the thousand dollars I'm making is good. So always be looking for the next thing. Think ahead. Budget considerations. We all budget our food. We budget propane. We we worry about how much gasoline we're spending on the generator. But very few people actually budget their marketing. I just realized I had those set to go backwards. That's a shame. Anyway, funding your plan. I recommend that you do at least 3% of your sales. So every day, 3% of your sales is going into an account that you don't touch except for marketing. Now compare that to restaurants uh, and the chains when they charge their franchisees. There's two, sometimes three different charges that, that they do a franchisee. One's a royalty. It's a royalty fee, and that's usually a percentage. Sometimes it can be a straight amount, but it's usually a percentage. Uh, then they also do their... Uh, charge their franchisees a marketing fee and it's done usually in two stages one is the national marketing for all the big commercials that you see for your Burger King McDonald's Wendy's whatever and then they'll set aside another smaller portion of again marketing budget that's for the local stores to use and to be able to use for whatever uh, things they do on a local level uh, so starting with three percent you may need five you may need seven but you want to start with something. Start at three. So on that $1,000 day, you're setting $30 aside. And you can either spend that tomorrow or let it accumulate in your account till you get you know, $200 and you can do ad drops on Facebook or uh, whichever social media you prefer. But the idea is to set aside money. Because I can promise you, if you have that money set aside, you'll want to spend it on marketing. But if you realize that your sales aren't where they want to be and you don't have any money set aside, now you're trying to figure out how can I scrape up $150, $200 to run an ad to help increase my sales. Now, this is one of the things I like to talk about, no hype. I'm not selling anything. Um, you can either agree or disagree with me, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You control your business. Uh, you control your own business destiny with marketing has to be done. And like I talked about, some of the things are passive. So anyone that says, I don't ever market. Yeah, you do. You've got a sign on the side of your truck. You've got your phone number there. You've got social media. You market. You just don't call it marketing. Uh, you know, attending a, a huge event, we all see this. Somebody says that I was promised there would be 1,000 people. There would be 2,000 people. There would be 50,000 people. And no one showed up. I don't care. If someone invites me to come to their business or to come to their neighborhood or to come wherever and they're not charging me money, why should I expect them to market my business? I'm going to market my business. I'm going to be, if I'm going to a neighborhood, I'm going to be knocking on doors. If they've got a community center, there's going to be flyers up there. I'm going to take the initiative because it's my business. I'm not going to depend on anybody to market for me. So when I see the sad stories about, I was told there'd be 300 people. I get really concerned because you didn't take the time to go out and market. I'm going to bring enough people to keep me supported. That's how confident I am in my marketing abilities and my ability to bring people out to me. You need to get that confident. You don't want to rest on anybody else supporting your business. When I do big events, the, I don't get to the huge ones. I don't like those. I hate crowds. <laughs> as much as I, I love having a line of people, I hate crowds. So I don't go to the events where there's 100,000 people or 200,000 people. I go to events that are usually in the uh, 40,000 over a weekend. So maybe eight to 10,000 a day, uh, you know, maybe 12,000 a day. So they're not crowded to me. But I market those events myself. They have marketing budgets. I always ask them, how big is your marketing budget? What's going to be your reach? How many people do you guys really expect to uh, be there? I'm going to quiz the promoters. 
and then I'm going to tell them, I'm going to market this too. And this is how I'm going to market it for my business. And I'm going to tell people I'm going to be at the Mullet Festival or the Billy Bowlegs Parade, or I'm going to be at the um, Destin Seafood Festival. I'm going to say I'm going to be there. And I'm going to tell the people I'm going to be there. I'm going to tell them repeatedly I'm going to be there and invite them to come out. And I'm going to do something special for my people that come out to that event, especially events that are paid to get in, like, again, the Mullet Festival or, or the um, Destin Seafood Festival. Folks had to pay to get in. Uh, at least they used to. So I'm going to market and then give them a little bit of a discount there because they're paying money to be able to get to my business. But hey, while you're here, you know, here's a little discount for you for coming in and, and helping me to survive. So don't depend on them. It's your business. Market it so well that your community blows away their projections. If you're doing a, a first-time car show, I see that a lot. Car shows typically are held where people can go to a restaurant on their own anyway. And car shows don't pull in a lot of people that are going to be there for hours upon hours. Only the car owners are going to be there a long time. The people coming to look stay an hour, maybe an hour and 45, and then they leave. And they're going to go get, going to go get food. You want to make sure that you're marketing your normal guests to come and eat with you. And then, hey, while you're here, check out the cars that are around me. That's how you want to be. You want to, to freak out their people that you brought in so many new car buffs because they weren't expecting uh, what you brought in yourself. Take uh, control of your business. If you're having a slow day, figure out why and then adjust your marketing to fix it. When you're new to this, you're not going to know why you're slow. There's times when I had $30 days when I, for no reason, could think of why it was a $30 day. Weather wasn't bad. You know, I was parked where I normally park, but I only did $30. Those happen. You need to figure out, what did I miss? What did I not notice? Uh, give you a great example. I ran the Quiznos in Destin, Florida for a number of years, and we were slow uh, one day. I mean, ridiculously slow. To the point that I was a little bit panicked because I couldn't afford the one person I had working with me. And I was trying to figure out why we were so slow. And then uh, I noticed some uh, younger people coming in and then realized, okay, there's something going on in town. So I had to read some newspapers and, and figure out what was going on. They ran a cheerleading contest, a college level cheerleading contest on the other side of Destin. So that pulled all the people that would have been in my area to the other side. And then while that was going on, they weren't driving to my part of town to eat. They were eating on that side of town. So those are the kind of thing you got to be aware of. What's pulling people away from where I am today? And next year, I'm going to be prepared for that. I'm either going to move closer to where the people are. I'm just not going to open. I'm going to open somewhere new. So be thinking about what is impacting your business. Figure it out. You guys, I'm sure you can think of one thing if you actually did it would um, improve your business. And I'm sure there's other things you can think of that would hurt your business. But the choice is yours. You can either act or don't act. The key is to do something to move your business forward and do it in a way that helps you to get more guests in, to treat the guests better, to do whatever it takes to encourage them to eat one more time with you. Guest loyalty matters uh, to your business. You can't be a one and done with your uh, your guest loyalty. All right, Q&A time. So I'm going to look at my phone. I'm going to answer a couple of questions while you guys... While you guys um, type in some questions for me. The uh, ad you see up here is something you can do on social media. And the reason this is here for you to think about your social media, when you look at that ad as a picture, you can see I've added my logo. you got to have your logo on all of your, uh, your food. That is actually a hot dog. I believe that's a hot dog I used for the cover of one of my books. I made that uh, hot dog and then took pictures of it with a, a uh, cell phone. 
So it's not perfect quality, but it does get the point across. And I've got it coming towards you. So it's making you look at that hot dog. Um, corner of 5th and Main, I'm going to be there from 11 to 2. And then in the text of that post, I'm going to pretty much repeat everything is in the picture. And then give them a price point. And then encourage them to order online if you do online ordering. I'm going to strongly urge everybody to do online ordering. I know it can be a, a mess. And the reason I know it can be a mess is because I was doing online orderings when we had to do it with a fax machine. So that means you always had to be listening for the fax machine to go off, to go rip that order off, punch it into your uh, cash register, and then forward that to the people in the kitchen. So people that have it easy now with online ordering where it actually comes in on your POS system, I don't want to hear complaints about that because I've done it the hard way. This is easy doing it, um, doing online ordering, especially when it comes in on your own POS system. All you do is work it into the order system that's already there in front of you. It's easy. Trust me, it's easy. And then you can do even something like this that doesn't talk about a specific food item, but this is setting up the example for someone. Um, if they're going to be at the Mullet Festival, hey, <laughs> Come see me because I got food and I got food you can rely on because you eat at my business through the week. Some people go to um, fairs and festivals because their kids want to go. And that's awesome. But they also want to eat food they um, feel fairly comfortable with. They're not going to experiment with uh, alligator meat and, and the typical fare that you get when you go to a festival or a big event. They want to know their, their kids are going to get wholesome food so I let people know I'm going to be there so I market it all the time and even this particular event you know 40,000 people is what they projected and in a lot of years I think we did more than 40,000 and it's just a matter of I want everyone that knows me to be there all right so let's see if anybody's got any questions let's see I'm going to answer the ones that were written to me if I can get out of my stream here. Noel had asked um, about free advertising platforms, social media, Craigslist. Are they as good, as good or better than paid platforms like a newspaper or radio? They both have their place. Um, small marketing budgets tend to favor free. And there's nothing wrong with, with free. I love free. Um, but social media also requires a little bit of a following. you got to take your personal social media, if you have 100 friends or 1,000 friends, and encourage them to like and share your business page so it gets out in front of more eyes. The more eyes that have the potential to see whatever advertising platform you use, the better off you're going to be. Um, you just got to build up your own following. It's just something that has to be done. And the easiest way to do that is to ask, again, friends and family, please help me get my business going. Please share what I'm I'm doing. Uh, Craig, Craigslist right now seems to be more full of scams than anything uh, or any time in, in the past. Um, and people really don't think of, man, I'm hungry, I'm going to go look at Craigslist. Uh, paid platforms work better when you have a strong call to action. What that means is a reason for them to uh, come to your business, like a printed coupon or being on the radio, like I mentioned earlier, as a part of a, uh, a, a trade where they do a contest and you just provide the uh, prize for the contest. Those things help you because it gets your name out there more frequently. And if you're doing like $50 worth of, of, uh, paid advertisement on Facebook, you want to see your likes increase, you want to see your followers increase, and you definitely want to see people coming. So if you ask them to, hey, just show them your cell phone with this, um, you know, coupon advertisement or whatever, at least they're doing something physical that makes them uh, want to come, and that way you know that your advertisement is reaching somebody. Uh, and then which do you have better luck with uh, advertising, a product, a brand, or location? Uh, we'll talk about branding just real quickly. Branding is a feeling that people have about your product. A large company like Kraft Foods 
people don't have a real good feeling about craft foods, but they um, know the brands like Maxwell House Coffee, or uh, and they may love Maxwell House, but they hate Cadbury. So they don't have an association with craft foods. So in that particular case, branding for craft is just a way to identify a different product that they sell. When you get into food service, uh, if somebody says, hey, let's go to McDonald's, everyone already has in their mind a little mini review about McDonald's. They know the products that McDonald's sells and they decide uh, whether they want to join in the group that's going to McDonald's or not based on their past experience with McDonald's. They don't necessarily think about the hamburger, the quarter pounder, or whatever new product they're selling now. They don't necessarily um, think about those. Um, let's see, where are we at here? Uh, we we're talking about the branding. Um, so some of your, your advertisements should be brand in nature. And that would be like the one that I did and showed you a few minutes ago with just my logo and talking about going to the Mullet Festival. There's no products involved. You're going to be more successful with a product because then people know what you sell. Once you have a reputation for selling whatever it may be, then you can do more branding things. McDonald's does two sets of, of um, types of advertisement. They will be product specific advertisements where they talk about the new product they're selling or the new you know, breakfast being served all day or whatever they're doing. They talk about a product. Then they also have the brand advertisements where it's just to make you feel good when you watch it. They'll um, you know, pick somebody that obviously has a disability and they're showing them smiling and taking care of customers or wiping tables or opening the door. All the things that make you feel good about, oh, McDonald's hired that person and they're being successful at McDonald's. And you feel good about what McDonald's does. You may hate their food, but you feel good about the brand in that moment because they did something good for somebody. So that's what branding does. Branding's a feeling. Uh, and you have to associate those feelings and it takes time to build up a brand awareness. So as a new truck, you want to basically bombard people with food, 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 and then occasionally your name, name and logo um, without association, associating food with it. Um, if you're going to do 100 ads a month or 100 posts a month, 70 of them need to, to really talk about your food in, in some way, shape, or form. And then the other 30 can just be neat things about um, how you feel, what you want to do for the day, you know, some uh, personal interest things uh, about you as the business owner, what your day's like. And then you want to talk about just, you know, hey, we got new uniforms in, we got new hats in, you know, anything that isn't food related, you want to, you can do those as well. But again, we sell foods, so let's talk about food. Okay, do the buy 10, get one free loyalty cards work? And what's a good number? Loyalty cards work, and I've been doing them since the 80s. Um, that's the mid 80s. Um, the thing about loyalty cards is there's a lot of different tricks you can do with them. If you're going to use 10, do a couple of pre punches just so that the folks feel they're getting a good deal. You only need eight now instead of 10. I always personally use seven for a, a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of them was just completely a personal reason. There's a song that I really like, and the title of the song is Seven, so I just use Seven. Um, seven's also an easy number for people to get to because it's one week. You know, I only have to come here seven times, so, you know, it, it's a smaller number. Ten being a double-digit number seems bigger than it really is. You know, when you look at it, it's only three more than seven, but there's just that psychological advantage of uh, a smaller number. And when you think about it, selling seven full price things and giving away the eighth one, it just really doesn't impact your profit that much. You know, if you're doing, um, let's say, a super expensive uh, steak or ribs or something, then you may want to move the numbers up or, or you know, get them, get the numbers higher. But there's other things you can do besides a, a loyalty card. A lot of POS systems now do. Uh, different types of tracking where you can set up points. Uh, they purchase so many dollars and they get so many points that can be redeemed for something. Um, 
And those are, are getting to be very, very popular because people just don't want to carry cards around anymore. But if you're, uh, you know, small business, limited budget, and you can't afford to have, you know, the fancy $50 and $60 and $70 subscriptions to loyalty tracking, then by all means do the uh, punch cards. But expect people to uh, lose them, and, and you won't get as many returned as you would hope. If you pass out 100, you might get, I don't know, maybe 30 people doing them. And out of that 30, maybe only 10 or so actually fulfill the whole thing. And the goal, remember, is to get people to come back frequently. So, yeah, I do loyalty cards very a good deal if they make sense to you. Uh, one little thing that I always did with mine when I did the hot dog cart was to make it a part of my business card. So that way I'm handing out a business card that's got all my information on it. Then it had just little seven stars on it. And underneath it, it said uh, in small print, collect them all. So somebody's looking at my card going, what does this mean? I could explain them. I explain to them what uh, the collect them all means. But if they're only interested in my business, say for a catering or something, they got all my information on that business card. And they don't have to care about collecting seven individual punches. So save me a little bit of money that way only having one card. And I always kept them on me, so I was passing them out to everybody that uh, was interested. Ashley had asked me uh, earlier today, about buying a brand new food truck, uh, not a trailer, or to buy a used vehicle and then have it, I uh, uh, assume, built yourself or built by somebody. Um, and there are a number of people that do school buses and RV conversions. Each of those have their own set of problems. Obviously, the ability to do plumbing and electric and carpentry yourself comes comes in very handy. Think of, of something like a school bus or even an RV for that matter. The roofs in those aren't reinforced. Um, the only place they'll reinforce an RV roof is where they actually put in the air conditioner that sits on top of the roof. So if you're going to be putting a hood, then you're obviously going to have to be able to reinforce the existing roof in some way, shape, or form. Can you save money buying something used like that and doing it yourself? Absolutely. <clears throat> but you want to consider your work in the particular vehicle has a value and i'm sure if you really sat down and paid yourself what you were worth to build that you're going to end up spending uh, the same amount of money as if you just went out and bought one um, as far as reputable companies uh, i would stick with a company that's been in business a number of years The reason I would go with somebody's got some uh, a number of years is you actually will have um, builds that they've done you can go look at and talk to those owners and say, hey, what happened when you first brought this home? How's it holding up? Uh, anybody that started, I would say even in the last three years, is somebody that I'm going to wait and let them get a good history built up before I go look at uh, them seriously as a company. Because it's really, really easy to, uh, if you've got the skills to diverge from being an auto repair shop to a build shop, uh, and then say, I can do food trucks because there's a lot of people that do food trucks and trailers that really have no clue about kitchen setup. The only thing they worry about is balancing the trailer or the truck so that all the weight's where it needs to be. And a lot of times when you look at what they do weight-wise, it makes no sense service-wise. So go with somebody who's been in business a while that understands that uh, they're building more than a truck that contains equipment. They're building a truck that needs to be able to service guests in an efficient manner. There's a couple places I listed on one of the units about recommendations. And those are the people that I have dealt with personally. Some of them are super expensive, but if you can afford it, I'd buy them because they're awesome. And every time I look at their website, I go, man, I wish I'd have bought these because they're, they are just so cool. They got all the bells and whistles. All right, let's see. What can I see here real quick? POS system, which one to use? For me, um, POS point of sale is what POS stands for. 
<clears throat> that's one of those terms that's morphed. Um, it used to be cash register. And a cash register is just a dumb machine that adds up numbers. That's a cash register. Then when they started making credit cards more prevalent, you had the little machine that added on to your cash register. So you would ring up uh, all your orders as cash uh, or credit and then had to put the cash or the credit receipt rather in the drawer to count that as actual cash. And the credit card machine stood alone from your cash register. Now with uh, everybody having a powerful computer in their pocket and POS apps are becoming, um, I hate to say a dime a dozen, but they, there are so many people that are producing these apps, it's hard to keep up with, with who is the best. Uh, what you're going to look for is rates on their uh, processing. You're going to look for any kind of subscription fees. You want to avoid a subscription of it all possible. The reason I want you to avoid subscriptions for new people is that's a fixed expense you can't get away from. You want to be able to pay as you go, so that way you're not facing down a bunch of subscriptions every month when it's rained for 20 days out of the month. Clover is a good, Andrea mentioned Clover. Clover's good. The problem that I have with Clover is they, um, Clover is produced by First Data, which got bought out, and I can't remember who bought them out. Anyway, they're a big company that produces the actual device, and then different banks will um, take the device and then offer it with whatever their rates are. I know one guy that gets unbelievably low rates. His bank is a local bank somewhere in one of the uh, northern Midwest states, South Dakota, North Dakota, one of those, um, and he gets unbelievable rates, but you have to be a um, client already of that bank to be able to use it. So when he brags about Clover and how awesome the rates are, and people read that, oh, that's great. This guy recommends them. I'm going to follow Clover. They go to their bank, and their rates are not much better than um, Square, for instance. You have to have a merchant account uh, when you use certain versions of Clover. Some people just don't qualify for merchant accounts. Uh, Third-party aggregate processors like Square, you don't have to have a merchant account. You can start your business up with Square in about 15 minutes-ish. We had a outage once upon a time in one of the restaurants where we lost our internet and we weren't going to get it back for a few days. And we ended up not being able to use our credit card processor because when you don't have internet, you can't process credit cards. So we were able to use Square and set it up immediately because Square will hold information so we could continue to process credit cards um, and then take the, you know, the phone out somewhere we could get an internet signal. Of course, this was back before Wi-Fi was so prevalent. Yeah, I'm that old. But anyway, the, the PLS that I would recommend it's got to be dependent upon what you need. If you're a hot dog cart and you're a one person operation, Square does awesome. Uh, Easy Eats is another one that I would, uh, would talk about. Uh, Easy Eats has a built in um, KDS, and a KDS is a kitchen display system, which is amazing if you use those. Most people I see, I want to, you know, they talk about Square and then getting the wireless printer, and you're still dealing with a physical ticket. A KDS is a touch screen that you can kick off orders as you do them. This particular one also gives you an all day total. So if you have a screen that's got seven orders, you don't have to read the whole screen. It'll tell you you've got, uh, you know, seven hot dogs, five hamburgers, you know, three Philly steaks, and it gives you that all day total. That's a pretty neat feature. And as you clear them off, it updates. Um, so it makes communication to the kitchen much more efficient. You don't have to worry about a wind gust blowing your uh, tickets everywhere. You don't have to worry about some new kitchen person getting the tickets out of order to where somebody who orders 10 minutes ago gets um, their order before someone that uh, uh, ordered 30 minutes ago. Those kind of problems happen when you use a physical ticketing system or you handwrite tickets. And I know there's people that do handwrite tickets. Uh, let's see, someone asked, 
Max did, at an event, what percent do you assume actually visits you? Uh, I developed a spreadsheet. I'm not sure if it's in the file section. If it's not, I'll put it there. But it helps you to think about all the important things on an event. It's not just how many people are going to eat with you, but how much that event costs you. For example, there's some big events uh, that cost several thousands of dollars to get into. And those would be the same events. If you attend it, you're going, why is this guy charging you know, $30 for a, a small pepperoni pizza? That's why. Because the event fees cost them so much. Uh, but people will uh, buy the food because there's no other food around them. They can't leave the event and drive uh, you know, 30 minutes into town to buy food. So they're basically at the mercy of whatever you're wanting to charge. As far as the number of people that are going to eat, it depends. Uh, it really does. The longer the event is in time, and the more reasons people have to stay at the event, the more people are going to eat. For example, if you have an event that's, again, say 30 minutes from the nearest real restaurant where you had to pay to get in and they have no uh, come and go system where they'll let you wander in and out of the event. Once you're in, you're in, and once you leave, you're gone then those people tend to stay and buy in the event and more of them buy. So then what really happens is who has either the food that people want to eat uh, as far as recognizable food that's going to appeal to the masses and then who is going to be fast enough to satisfy those particular people's needs. If you want to pin me down to a number, I'm going to say no more than um, one third of the people that attend event are going to eat at any given time. And realistically, it's probably more like 15% uh, are going to eat. Most people that are on a budget going to an event, feed their family, drive to the event, stay at the event until their family gets hungry, then they leave. And they won't you know, pay the prices of event food. Um, and there are people that will, again, Pay whatever you're charging just because they got the money to blow. So if somebody tells me a thousand people are going to be there, I'm figuring 300 at most are going to eat something, whether it's, you know, just buying a soda or buying a full meal, they're going to eat something. And then I divide that number by the number of food outlets that are going to be there. So if there's 10 food outlets, then I'm thinking that's only 30 people. And again, that's fair share. We're all getting uh, 300 people and we're splitting it 10 ways. That ain't going to work. You know, so it, it really, it does depend. I wish I could give you an exact answer, but my experience is somewhere around 15% consistently eat and it does creep up the longer the event is. And Nick says a mobile ordering can be so easy and that's true. It can be extremely easy. Starting out with a tent, uh, same things apply. Same things actually apply. You're still selling food. You still got all the permits and stuff you got to deal with. You still got to market. You're going to market in a similar manner here. Um, if you're going to be open just on the weekends, then you want to make sure you're building towards that weekend. Uh, you know, so you're going to be marketing Monday, social media, Tuesday, social media, and on and on so that you can get those people uh, going to your uh, your trailer set up or your, your tent set up rather on the weekends. I'm reading through the comments. Um, you know, Nick's pointing out that 30% eat at a food centric event. And again, it, it depends. Well, Food centric means that there's more than uh, or there's only food or very limited things um, to distract people away. Um, typically, I, I personally don't go to uh, food trailer, or food truck events. Uh, I never have. Not as a vendor, I'll go to them to check out the competition and see what they're doing because they all gather in one place. It makes it easy on me. I don't like going to those events and it's just a personal preference. I know people that go to them and they make really, really good money. 
It's just one of those things that uh, I just don't want to do. So when you go to a food truck rally, per se, if there's you know 15 trucks, you're going to divide the number of people they expect by, uh, by 15. Some trucks are going to do better. Some trucks are going to do worse. And again, the longer the event is and the more things there are for people to do, the longer they stay. Uh, the kind of events I attend are usually uh, weekend events, start on Friday night, uh, run all day Saturday, close you know, usually at 5 o'clock on Sunday. So they'll have a concert on Friday night and a concert on Saturday night. That's when you get your butt kicked as, as people are going to the concert and as people leave the concert. And, and those are the fun times. That's when you actually have a, you know, a strong line and... That's when you win, when you have good customer service. All right, let's see. I'm sure I've talked way longer than I intended. Yeah, it's already 11 minutes after. Any more quick questions, and then I will end this. I thank everybody for your participation. If I missed a question, I will go through all of the um, comments at the end and, um, and answer them in written form if I didn't talk about them here. I'll edit this down a little bit uh, and put it on YouTube and make it available on um, our group as well. But I appreciate everyone that did stick around. Let's see, we're down to 19 people left. Oh, thank you for, for being here. I don't know if I'm wise. I'm, I'm definitely talkative, though. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Noel. I hope I answered your question. I kind of brushed over it because I had something actually written out and then I couldn't find it quick enough. So I will, again, answer all the questions that I, if I miss somebody. Y'all have a great night and I will talk to y'all very, very soon. <music>